Our topic tonight uh, is U.S.-China relations, uh, an enormously important topic, as, as all of you know. And we're very fortunate to be joined by Dean Harry Harding, uh, an expert on China and on U.S.-China relations. Uh, Professor Har uh, Harding is a uh, graduate of Princeton, he did his Ph.D. and M.A. work uh, at Stanford University. He's taught at Swarthmore College at uh, Stanford and uh, has been a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution in foreign policy. Uh, his pro professional reputation is underlined by his di directorships of various kinds. He's a director or a trustee or a member of nearly all of the major organizations dealing with uh, Asian affairs, uh, both in terms of public policy and uh, academia. His three books tell you a lot about his interests. Uh, the first, which is the challenge of, of all time, Organizing China, a study of the bureaucracy from 49 to 76. It had to have been undertaken, I'm sure, as his PhD dissertation. The uh, second book is on the second re China's second revolution, uh, China after Mao. And his third book, uh, A Fragile Relationship, uh, deals with American or with U.S. and uh, China relations from uh, 1972 until it was published in 1992, which covers a significant particular period in our, uh, our relations with China. Um, he hasn't started on a fourth book on the period since 1992, which for many would be fascinating, of course. But he does bring to us continued study of U.S.-China relations. Uh, we're delighted that he's agreed to join us this evening. It's my great pleasure to present Dean Harry Harding. Well, thank you, and good evening, everyone. That was a very, very gracious introduction. It's an enormous pleasure for me to be here in Baltimore. Um, it's um, a marvelous city, very close to Washington, that I get to visit all too seldom. And it's a particular pleasure for me to be in this room with this group. I think that councils and committees like this are extremely important parts of our foreign policy process in a democracy informed opinion about complex issues is uh, extremely important. And at a time when interest and knowledge about, interest in and knowledge about international affairs seems to be declining, it really is uh, important for organizations like this to continue their work. I also have to say how impressed I am with you as an audience already on two dimensions. One was that as I came in after rushing up um, in traffic that does indeed get worse each time I drive up here, um, came in just a few minutes before six, I realized that already people were moving from what I thought would be the center of attention, which was the drinks and the food graciously provided by Procter & Gamble Cosmetics, uh, and conversations with their friends to sit down and wait attentively for the program to begin. I have seen very, very few organizations where that ever happens <laughs> without a lot of gong beating or bell ringing or whistling or tapping on the microphone trying to get people to sit down. That really is uh, truly impressive, and I was uh, genuinely impressed. Then the layout of this room is really quite interesting because you walk in and you see some people standing at that point looking out the window talking, having their drinks, and you come around and each step you take you see what a large audience this is. It's far larger than you think when you first come in. This is an extraordinary turnout. So I'm really looking forward to uh, this evening. I'm delighted to be here and I appreciate the invitation. Um, what I'm going to do this evening is to begin with some very broad and almost philosophical remarks about U.S.-China relations, both analytical, that is, how I view them today, and also prescriptive, that is, what I would recommend our policy should be. I will leave plenty of time for questions where you should feel free to raise all of the detailed issues, be they Taiwan or human rights or trade or proliferation, uh, or national missile defense, or the South China Seas, um, and I will try to answer all of, them, all of them as best I can. But if I were to try to deal with those detailed issues in my opening remarks, 
it would become a very long laundry list. Uh, each of them would get very superficial treatment. And I think there are some important general things that need to be said about U.S.-China relations, especially at this point in time. Now, what do I mean by that? I think for two reasons this is a particularly auspicious time to speak about uh, U.S.-China relations. Number one, this is a presidential election year. Uh, this is the time when traditionally Americans step back, reflect about broad issues, broad trends, broad directions that they want their country to take. And obviously, the course of presidential campaigning, uh, if you have some strong candidates, as I think we have this time, uh, in the course of that presidential campaigning, the candidates are going to raise some of these broad uh, philosophical directions about uh, where this country should go. So in this election year, I think China is already becoming an issue. Uh, and uh, in a way tonight, I'm going to uh, hopefully make a small contribution to that discussion and that debate. Secondly, the second reason why this is an auspicious moment is that we have just dodged a couple of bullets on U.S.-China relations uh, that have uh, removed us at least temporarily from what could have been a very serious crisis in U.S.-China relations. Step back, if you will, in your minds to 1995-96 before the last presidential election on Taiwan, uh, just after uh, the People's Republic of China had conducted major military exercises uh, in the Taiwan Straits, had test-fired uh, some new um, intermediate-range ballistic missiles in the direction of Taiwan, some landing in the ocean right off some of Taiwan's major ports. And with that in mind, ask yourself, from the vantage point of 1995-96 looking forward, if you had been able to predict that at the next presidential election, the people of Taiwan would elect the leader of the opposition party, the party that historically had been committed to independence, the party whose platform contained a plank that called for a unilateral declaration of independence. And if you had forecast from that vantage point, if you had known that that candidate was going to win the next time in the elections of 2000, what would you have predicted the cross-strait relationship and therefore U.S.-China uh, relationships to have been? Fortunately, because of some very careful management of that relationship on both sides of the Taiwan Strait, and in particular because of an extraordinarily graceful performance by the new Taiwanese president, uh, Chen Shui-bian, we have dodged that particular bullet, quite literally, and we bought some time in cross-straits relations and in U.S.-China relations. Similarly, think back um, a, long, a shorter period of time, back to just about a year ago, the aftermath of the tragic, mistaken U.S. bombing of the Chinese embassy in Belgrade, in uh, Yugoslavia, uh, the former U Yugoslavia. In the aftermath of the seeming collapse of the uh, U.S.-China negotiations over WTO. And ask yourself, um, what were the chances for a successful WTO agreement? Then fast forward to the agreement itself, but noting the rising opposition in Congress and among labor unions, ask, what are the chances that this will actually get through the House of Representatives? We've dodged a second bullet in that Congress has acted, at least the House has acted, in a way that I regard as uh, farsighted and responsible. Uh, Senate uh, passage of uh, the same legislation is not assured, but it is highly likely. Uh, and so China will enter the WTO and the U.S. Uh, by granting China PMTR will get the benefits of that. So that we are at a time where things could have been a lot worse. If Chen Shui-bian had come into office still insisting on a formal declaration of independence for Taiwan, if on top of that the House of Representatives had rejected permanent normal trade represent, uh, uh, relations uh, for China, I would be giving a very, very different talk than I am going to give tonight. And fortunately, I can give version B and not version A. So it's an appropriate time at which to step back and to uh, try to uh, um, look at the, the China problem in its broadest dimensions and uh, talk a bit about what the American response to the China issue might be. What kind of country is China, and what kind of relationship do we have uh, with China? 
Let me begin my remarks tonight, or at least the substance of my remarks tonight, by arguing that China is indeed the central kingdom, the central country, or at least one of them. That secondly, it is an extraordinarily complex society. And thirdly, that our relationship with China is unusually turbulent. I've chosen my word carefully. I don't say fragile anymore. I say turbulent. Uh, but it is one that has um, unusual amounts of ups and downs in terms of their frequency and in terms of their severity. Let me deal with each of these points in turn, because I think they're very important in understanding what China is and what our relationship uh, with China is. The centrality of China. Well, of course, the Chinese, as all of you who know anything about China know, uh, often describe themselves as the Middle Kingdom or the Central Kingdom. That is what the two characters in Chinese for China, Zhongguo, literally mean, the country in the middle, the center of the world. And indeed, Americans have often treated China uh, as the central kingdom, as a central element in our foreign policy. In part, this is entirely rational. In part, however, it uh, represents a distinctively American preoccupation uh, with China. So in our relationship, we have to sort out, on the one hand, that element of our preoccupation which is warranted, and that part which is, uh, to a degree, exaggerated. The warranted part of uh, our preoccupation with China is that China is indeed uh, a very significant nation, and becoming more so all the time in international affairs. To give a few examples, it is, of course, the most populous nation in the world. And therefore, it will contribute, especially as it modernizes, to the full range of uh, environmental uh, and other non-conventional problems, non-conventional security problems that simply arise from a huge uh, population uh, where the uh, pressure of people against a limited arable land supply uh, is, uh, as always, very, very severe. China occupies a central place on the Eurasian landmass. On the eastern part of Asia uh, and the Eurasian landmass, China is today, as it has always been, the dominant continental power. Uh, that is a fact of geography that is not going uh, to change. China is rapidly becoming, uh, what it had not been for about 100 years, a major player in the world economy. Uh, it is uh, a very large economy, either second or third, depending on how you count, not because it is yet so developed. In per capita terms, it is still a developing nation, but by dint of its huge population. It is also rising in importance as a trading nation, and now ranks well within the top 10 of America's uh, trading partners. Uh, it is an extremely important um, uh, locus for foreign direct investment. Uh, most years, it is the single most important uh, location for direct foreign investment in the developing world, and sometimes it has even rivaled the United States for the top position anywhere in the world. In other words, attracting more direct investment than any other country uh, on Earth. It is a nuclear power that is seeking to modernize its military arsenals. Uh, it is accused of uh, some forms of proliferation. Uh, if not of nuclear weapons, then at least of the missiles that could uh, deliver them. It is a permanent member of the UN Security Council with all of the rights and veto <laughs> privileges that that entails. It is a country that believes it has a right, given its size, its history, and its culture, to a leading position in international affairs. Uh, it is a country that others, as well as the United States, think is important. It is a country that thinks itself is important. It is therefore not unreasonable that we attend to it. It is a central and important country in our foreign policy. Having said this, however, we Americans have a preoccupation uh, with China that sometimes is um, a little bit worrisome, not so much to me, perhaps, as to other countries in the region, where the American preoccupation with China at the expense of other countries in Asia, including some of our most long-standing friends, and I'm thinking particularly of Japan, but also to a degree of Southeast Asia, is something that we need to um, pay attention to and I think control for. 
Yes, China is important. It may be an important problem. But we have to understand in dealing with China that we have to place China in a broader regional context. We need to pay attention to our other Asian and Pacific neighbors, including and most especially those that are allies and friends of the United States, uh, and not focus so centrally with, uh, uh, on our relationship with China. One concrete example of this was the controversy that occurred in Asia and especially in Japan when President Clinton visited China in 1998 and did not stop in Japan either on his way there or, the, or his way back. Now, I could argue that for a variety of reasons, presidents can't stop everywhere every time, and that for a variety of reasons on this particular trip, it was appropriate that China be the central focus of his visit, uh, that it deserved a little bit more attention than it might otherwise get. But the reaction in Japan was one of extreme dissatisfaction, precisely because it triggered this notion, it activated this prejudice that Americans care only about China, they neglect the rest of us. Uh, and we have to be careful to uh, show very clearly that we see China's importance, but we see China in context. There is also a sense to which uh, countries um, other, in other parts of the world um, sort of marvel at our preoccupation with China. Going back to the late 1940s when uh, Franklin Roosevelt and Winston Churchill designed what they thought was going to be a stable post-World War II order, uh, the two leaders had a very interesting and significant debate about China. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt wanted China to be one of the permanent members of the Security Council. He thought that China, even under the nationalists, even under Chiang Kai-shek, deserved that status. Winston Churchill was not so sure. And from the British perspective, he felt Americans were once again exaggerating the importance of China because of their perpetual love affair with the country, or at least their fascination uh, with the country. Uh, so that many things we do, uh, even in Europe, are regarded as re representing a preoccupation uh, with China. So my first point is, yes, China is important. We certainly need to pay attention to it and interact to it with it. I'll come back to the implications of that in a moment. But we also have to understand, we'll put it this way, that many other countries are concerned that we are preoccupied with China and that we have to be careful to send very clear signals that uh, other countries are important to us too, uh, that we want to cooperate with them in dealing with China, and above all, that we take their opinions and their advice very seriously in formulating our China policy. Second point about China is that it is an extraordinarily complex country. This is a country that I visit um, very frequently. I'll be leaving day after tomorrow for uh, another trip. I was just there a couple of weeks ago. I have to say my trips are frequent, brief, and superficial. But nonetheless, every time I go, I am struck by some kind of contradiction, some kind of puzzle of two things that don't seem uh, to fit uh, together. Uh, the last trip, for example, I was struck um, by uh, evidence of a sign of rising nationalism in China, uh, especially among young people. And yet, when I took a, a walk down the main shopping street, or traditionally the main shopping street of uh, Beijing, Wangfujing, I was surrounded by a group of students from the Xi'an Fine Arts Academy who were in Beijing on a, uh, on a school visit. Uh, who were as outgoing, friendly, curious about America as I've ever seen in my uh, quarter century of visiting uh, China. Uh, so again, a, uh, a contradiction. What are some of the real complexities of China on an other than anecdotal uh, basis? We've already touched on some. Here is a country that in the aggregate is probably the third, possibly the second largest economy in the world and yet a country that is poor uh, in per capita terms and where the pockets of poverty, and these are big pockets indeed, uh, remain uh, very, very uh, depressing. This is a country that uh, has uh, benefited enormously from an opening to the outside world. Uh, exports have led Chinese growth. Investment has fueled that growth. And yet it is a country that is uh, simultaneously uh, still relatively closed to uh, foreign uh, exports, and there are serious doubts as to the extent to which the WTO agreement is going to change uh, the situation. 
This is a country that uh, um, is uh, seen by many as a uh, very repressive regime, and it certainly violates the human rights that Americans hold dear, the right to freedom of expression on political issues, the right to organize uh, politically, the right to practice religion freely. And yet it is a country where almost every Chinese will tell you their life is far better on every dimension now than it has been any time in their lifetime and any time in the modern uh, history of China. This is a country that has joined uh, regime after regime, international regime after international regime, from the WTO to the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty uh, to the Missile Technology Control Regime, even to some of the covenants on human rights. And yet it is also a country that complains about the one-sided character of these regimes, the way in which they're biased towards the interests of the West, and complains about the way in which they infringe on China's sovereignty. One could go on and on and talk about these contradictions, but the point is that I can think of very few, if any, significant statements about China, I should say significant and valid statements about China, that don't have a but in them somewhere. China is the classic uh, example of the country that you need two hands to deal with, on this hand and yet on the other hand. It is an extremely complex uh, society. Thirdly, our relationship towards uh, China or, or, or with China uh, has been uh, always quite turbulent. Um, it is a relationship that has vacillated between periods of exaggerated warmth and friendship on the one hand, and then perhaps equally exaggeration, estrangement, and mutual isolation uh, on the other. I can think of no major power uh, with whom our relations with China, with whom our relations have oscillated as many times over the last 100 or 150 years uh, as they have uh, with China. Uh, my book uh, that dealt with one two-decade period in U.S.-China relations was called A Fragile Relationship. And that indicated that the time I wrote it, I was concerned that these oscillations could actually break the relationship apart and that we could return to another period of estrangement and mutual hostility uh, such as the one that we experienced in the 1950s and 60s. Today, I hope, and I'm reasonably confident, to think that the growing economic interdependence of our two societies and the growing rationality of the Chinese policy making, making process provides an underlying stability to the relationship so that it is not so fragile. But as the events of the last year or so, or so have shown, it can be turbulent. There can be enormous ups and downs, swings of the emotional pendulum uh, in our relationship even now, given that the underlying dimension may be uh, a, bit more, a, a bit more stable. Uh, why is it so turbulent? Many scholars, many historians of American foreign policy and U.S.-China relations have tracked in great detail the ups and downs of this relationship, and especially at the level of popular perceptions, the way in which Americans have swung in their views of China from uh, stereotypes of China as a uniquely humane, cultured, friendly society uh, to one that is repressive, uh, that at a very basic human level is, um, um, is uh, some, some, to some degree uncivilized uh, and whose government has very hostile intentions uh, towards, uh, towards the United States. Um, and uh, those who have tracked the Chinese side of the equation have uh, seen many of the same uh, phenomena, including right up to the present, uh, where young Chinese who, after Tiananmen, were hailing the United States for its championship of human rights in China are just as likely now to accuse the United States of using human rights as a tactical device to keep China weak, to destabilize it, and to keep it in its place. So it's been tracked pretty well. But why is this happening? Here, there have been very few explanations. I would simply suggest that uh, some of the uh, elements that I've already mentioned, uh, the centrality of each country to the other, and the complexity of each po country's policies uh, towards each other, and the complexity of each country's uh, underlying circumstances are part of the answer here. In other words, Americans and Chinese are always discovering that other hand. They look at the one side of the picture, they get excited or they get frustrated, 
uh, then suddenly they notice that there is the other side of the coin, and overnight the uh, attitude can, can change, a kind of gestalt switch from positive and negative uh, and back again. Well, why is it that the two countries can't simply see those complexities uh, at the same time, instead of alternating between positive and negative and black and white? And I think here there is one other factor, and that's a cultural factor. Both countries are very, very highly moralistic societies. They tend to view politics, whether it's domestic or international, as a struggle between good and evil. Uh, they don't see it as a pragmatic solution to problems. They get very uh, emotional and moralistic about uh, various political relationships. Um, I will give tribute for this insight to a British businessman. I think enough years have passed that I can identify him by company, if not by name, Cable and Wireless, which is one of the great British uh, international telecommunications firms, who came to Washington sometime during that 95-96 crisis over the Taiwan Straits, concerned about the implications of a possible blow-up for his com company's business uh, in uh, China and in Asia, and called together a group of American China watchers and Chinese America watchers, which basically meant people from the Chinese embassy in Washington, to a carefully selective neutral ground, a Middle Eastern restaurant uh, off of DuPont Circle, got a private room, arrayed us on two sides of a table, sat at one end, and let us at each other. It was a very civilized discussion, and we didn't throw bread or knives at each other. Uh, but it was clear that uh, some of the issues uh, in U.S.-China relations were very forthrightly and directly expressed. Over coffee and a pause in the conversation, this gentleman literally leaned back in his chair, and he said, do you know what the problem here is? You two are so bloody similar. Now, this was a big shock to the Chinese and the Americans who had been arguing with each other all evening. Uh, they had not seen the similarities at all. Instead, they had been rehearsing the differences. And this gentleman from cable and wireless never explained what he meant. We were all too stunned to say, huh, or what do you mean, or please explain this interesting insight. We all just kind of stat, sat there dumbfounded. But I've been thinking about it for basically the last five years, and this is my conclusion. We are bloody similar because we tend to view the world in the same way as a struggle between right and wrong, and if we agree, that's great, because we're obviously both right. But if we disagree, that's a little more difficult, because obviously I'm right, and you must be wrong. Uh, and it is an emotional and moralistic quality to our views of politics that I think cause uh, some of the turbulence, uh, previously fragility in our relationship. Now, given this, if this is anywhere near the truth, that China is central, although perhaps not quite as central as we sometimes imagine, or that they would like us to believe, that it is an extraordinarily complex country, that our relationship has historically been turbulent, albeit with an uh, increasing um, basis, perhaps, of economic interdependence. What kind of, country, uh, what kind of policy should the United States have towards such a country? This is a very difficult, I think, issue for Americans uh, to deal with. Because, as I've just implied, culturally we have tended to divide the world into friends and foes, allies and adversaries. And for a country that is as complex as China, it is not going to fit into either of those two boxes uh, particularly uh, neatly. Uh, we also uh, tend to divide uh, countries more recently and President Nixon alluded to this distinction even a few days ago in his comments on uh, sharing uh, uh, national missile defense technology in Moscow uh, into the civilized and the what? Non-civilized, we don't use that word anymore, we use the word rogue. Civilized states and rogue states. Well, which is China? It is a question of some embarrassment to this administration. It cannot tell you where China fits. They don't want to call it a rogue nation, but they don't want to call it a civilized nation. We divide the world into these categories. China does not fit uh, anywhere. We divide the world into those countries that we recognize and those that we do not. This is one of the most uh, clear operationalized uh, ways in which we uh, exercise moral judgment. Recognition for Americans is not recognizing a fact, it's recognizing a virtue. Uh, so we recognize or we isolate and ignore. 
Uh, China does not fit neatly into those category, category of countries that we want to praise by our recognition, uh, even to the point of giving it normal trade relations, but it is also a country that we cannot ignore either. So in other words, China, with its complexity, uh, is a country that is very difficult for Americans uh, to deal with. Nor has the debate on this subject been particularly illuminating in recent years, in my judgment. As I turn now to what I think our policy towards China should be, uh, let me rehearse the debate as we tend to hear it uh, on television, read about it in the press, indicate why I think it doesn't really satisfy, and then uh, conclude with a few uh, suggestions, again, on a very high, almost philosophical plane of my own. One of these debates is between the proponents of uh, isolation and engagement, or at least this is how it's often portrayed in the press and in political discourse. Those who want to engage China and those who want to isolate it. This debate really stems from the immediate post Tiananmen period uh, in 1989, 1990, 1991 where, of course, there was a huge revulsion at what Americans had seen occurring in Beijing, <coughs> even more revulsion if they'd seen it occurring in several other cities in China, which it did happen uh, at around the same time. And Americans did not want their government officials to be dealing with that country. If you can remember uh, that far back, the revulsion that occurred when it was revealed that uh, several high officials, uh, in particular uh, the then uh, National uh, Security uh, Advisor Brent Scowcroft, had visited China and had actually gone to banquets with Chinese officials and had actually drunk champagne with them and had actually raised glasses and toasted uh, to uh, the relationship between the two countries. Americans at that time wanted nothing to do with the Chinese government. And the United States had a policy of cutting off all high-level dialogue with the Chinese government. That really is a policy of, at least in relative terms, isolation. We didn't cut off diplomatic relations, as we had from 1949 until, in effect, uh, 1973. Uh, we maintained embassies. But we isolated China at the highest levels as a sign of our disdain and contempt uh, for what their government had done in, uh, in Tiananmen Square almost exactly, what, um, 11 years ago uh, uh, today. The alternative that was put forward and uh, generally uh, prevailed over time was a policy of engagement, that instead of refusing to deal with Chinese leaders, we should engage with them. We should restore high-level dialogue. This was a gradual process that culminated with the uh, summit meetings between China's President Jiang Zemin and our President Bill Clinton in uh, 1997 and 1998, which represented the full normalization of that type of relationship and the end, finally, of the policy of, uh, of, of isolation. As you can imagine, I believe that uh, of these two possibilities, engagement is far superior. China is simply not a country that uh, we can isolate any longer, nor is it a country that we should want to isolate. China is simply too important. It is too central uh, for us to try to isolate, to try to ignore. A policy of isolation of a country that is so important on so many issues is simply not possible. It is not sustainable, and it was not sustainable when it was attempted in the early 1990s. But is engagement that much better, an alternative? Well, certainly it's better than isolation. But when you think about engagement, what does it mean? And I don't mean so much literally, although the term itself is very confusing. It sent the Chinese quite literally to their dictionaries to figure out what the word engagement means to Americans. And they were puzzled. They had not know how to translate into Chinese, for one thing. How do we tell our leaders? They're saying a policy of engagement, of comprehensive engagement. So if you are a Chinese America watcher, your first challenge is, how do I translate this into Chinese? And then the question is, well, what does it mean in English? OK, well, think about it. Think about it. De go, go think of a mental dictionary, definition one, an agreement to get married a betrothal. Hmm, don't think that's probably what they have in mind, boss, although we might check it out. Next, military skirmish 
uh, a um, confrontation between military forces as in the engagement between the infantry of the two armies at the Battle of Dodo. Well, now, this is a little more serious and a more likely possibility. Comprehensive engagement means they're going to be at us on our throats on every dimension. Definition three, a process of interaction as when gears engage, the engagement of gears. I'm engaging the third gear in my car as I get up some speed. So engagement was a profoundly ambiguous word to the Chinese who had to figure out what to, uh, how to translate it uh, into their language. But I'm not even referring to that. I'm assuming we know that it was definition three, the opposite of isolation, a process of dialogue, of interaction and discussion. But engagement for what purpose? Talking about what? With what interests in mind? With an objective of going where in the relationship? Engagement does not imply any particular outcome. It simply means you'll sit down and talk and you won't ignore each other. So this was a preferable alternative to isolation, but it still left open the profound question of what kind of relationship are we going to uh, create, uh, if, or try to create at least, through uh, the process of engagement. Then we come to the more recent debate, and this brings us actually down to the presidential election campaign of this year, uh, where the two main presidential candidates, uh, Al Gore and George Bush, have put forward different outcomes of engagement. Uh, Vice President Gore seems to be committed to the Clinton administration vision of building a constructive strategic partnership with China. Uh, the vice Pre the um, uh, governor of Texas, uh, Mr. Bush, has declared flatly he does not see China as a partner. He sees it as a, as a competitor. Uh, so we have two very different visions of the relationship, one where uh, the negative prevails, the one where the positive uh, uh, prevails. My own view is that if I were trying to design a policy for it towards the future, uh, that I find the Gore vision and the Clinton vision the more attractive. I certainly want a partnership with China. I would far rather to have a cooperative relationship with so important a country than I want to have a competitive, let alone a conflictual uh, relationship. Uh, however, that begs the question of how we get there. How do we build towards a constructive strategic partnership? The Clinton administration has never really spoken to that question. And as they become more and more on the defensive because of the controversy this term has surrounded, uh, the more and more unlikely they are to, to address it. So let me conclude with some broad recommendations of what kind of a strategy we might um, apply towards China, towards the central but complex country, with an eye towards trying to build towards a cooperative uh, rather than a conflictual or even a competitive uh, relationship. Let me suggest the following elements that I think are important. Let me begin with reassurance. You may find this strange, but in some ways I put this at the top of my agenda given my understanding of what many Chinese worry about and think about these days. We need to reassure China, and here I'm referring far more to the people of China than to their leaders, that we genuinely wish them well. We need to convince them that we are not trying to keep them down, keep them in their place, but that we would genuinely welcome their success. We are not trying to exclude them from the international community, but we are trying to integrate them into it. We favor political reform and respect for human rights, but not because we are trying to promote instability or chaos, which many Chinese think is our hidden motive. Rather, because we think that reform and respect for lives will promote stability in the long run, as well as meaning a far better life for the ordinary uh, people of China. We want to see a peaceful and mutually agreeable solution to the Taiwan question. We would be um, extremely uh, agitated if uh, China were to attempt to impose its will by force, but we endorse unification. If that is indeed the solution that occurs and emerges from uh, a peaceful and mutually agreeable process. We maintain our alliance with Japan 
but that alliance is not targeted against China. It is not targeted against anyone. It is simply a partnership that enables both countries to work together to address major regional and global problems. And most basically, as I've just implied, the task of reassurance is to tell the Chinese that we want a cooperative relationship with them. Indeed, dare I say it, a constructive strategic partnership with the prosperous, democratic, just, stable China that we hope will emerge after a few more decades of growth and reform. In other words, we wish China well. We don't see them as our enemy. We don't want them to be our enemy. We want a cooperative relationship, but that it will take the efforts of both sides, them and us, if we are to achieve that goal. Second, integration. As I've just noted, we want to further integrate China into the international uh, community. This means far more than just engagement in bilateral dialogue with China. It has a much more deeper significance. It means bringing China into rules-based international regimes and institutions. And China has, as I've already indicated, already made great strides in that direction. It has subscribed to most of the major non-proliferation regimes, including the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty and the no Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty although its willingness to ratify the CTBT is now quite um, low, given the reluctance of our own Congress to do the same. China has now signed both of the major international covenants on human rights and has recognized the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, universal validity and application. It is becoming part of the international environmental regime, uh, and we are very close to the conclusion of the process of bringing China into the rules-based trade regime that is the World Trade Organization. Now, we should not be naive about the process of integration. I'll get to the issue of enforcement in a moment. But integration of China into international regimes is not always going to have the outcomes that the United States is going to want. As China enters these regimes, at least living regimes like the WTO, it will have a seat at the table. As we develop new rules, further rules, it is not automatic that China is going to take the same position as the United States on questions such as labor standards, environmental standards, uh, further development of the non-proliferation regime. We will have to argue and indeed compete with China for support among the other members of those regimes. At the same time, we should understand that it is very unlikely that all regimes are going to develop to the point where they completely prohibit every action that the United States may disapprove of. We may not like to see China sell certain kinds of weapons to Iran, uh, for example, uh, or even to Libya, but the fact of the matter is that China's doing so violates no international regime. It violates no international law. It's just that we don't like it. We should not assume that bringing China into a rules-based community will eliminate all differences with China because we'll continue to argue with China over the evolution of those rules, and those rules will not prohibit all behavior of which we disapprove. But still, it's an important step forward. Third, enforcement. As China joins international regimes and institutions, we and the rest of the international community have the right to expect greater compliance with them. This is not to say that China's performance will be perfect. Europe's is not, America's is not. But China should clearly evince a willingness to conform with its international obligations. And in turn, promoting that compliance can be seen as a kind of enforcement of international norms. Sometimes this can be done through international mechanisms, such as the dispute resolution mechanisms of the WTO. Sometimes it will involve criticism of China's conduct in international fora. Sometimes it may, in extreme cases, involve economic sanctions by like-minded countries, especially in areas of non-proliferation. Defining the appropriate response to violations of international norms and laws will always be a challenge, but they'll be more effective if it's clearly portrayed as upholding multilateral international obligations that China has undertaken rather than imposing unilateral preferences on Beijing. Next, fourth, cooperation. We should show a sincere willingness to work together with China, not only to advance common interests, but also to narrow differences on both multilateral and bilateral issues. 
we've already shown what we can do. We are already cooperating quite well on the horribly important problem of trying to bring North Korea out of isolation, starvation, economic collapse into a soft landing where it enjoys economic recovery but begins to act as a more responsible and cooperative uh, member of the international community. We can see the benefits of cooperation. We can only wonder what the outcome and the evolution of the situation on the Korean Peninsula would be if China chose not to cooperate with the United States and Japan in dealing with the problem of, uh, of Pyongyang. So that we see that cooperation works, it can be done, and without compromising our interests in um, areas such as human rights, without refraining from criticizing China's shortcomings in appropriate ways, we can see in this area, for example, places where we can cooperate with China. This is not just an area where we criticize, sanction, and punish. We can actually cooperate, especially in the areas of the rule of law, administrative reform, poverty alleviance, other aspects of good governance, such as village and other local elections. We can also try to narrow our differences on the emerging issues in the international community, especially humanitarian intervention. My own discussions on this issue in Beijing suggest to me that on the one hand, China is extremely nervous about humanitarian intervention into what it regards as other countries' internal affairs. But the Chinese are pre prepared to have a very open-minded conversation on the subject, and my sense is that their mm -hmm. attitudes are changing. They realize that this is an issue that itself is complicated and that China needs to look at it uh, in a more sophisticated and subtle way. Next, strength. If we are to deter China from challenging vital American interests, let alone to prevail in any confrontation that might occur, we have to remain strong. Our Chinese colleagues frequently tell me that China feels less able to challenge America's international leadership today than it did several years ago because of it regards as a surprising revitalization of American national strength, especially the American economy. China's analysts are concluding that the world is not becoming as multipolar as quickly as they once believed, and that China, therefore, has little choice but to work within the present international order led by the United States. Frankly, that change in Chinese calculations is a welcome development from the American perspective. Uh, we should remain strong so as to continue to uh, deter a fundamental challenge by China to uh, the uh, prevailing international order or the American role in it. Chinese strategists, however, give us an important thing to think about. National strength must be comprehensive. This is not just military strength, not just political strength, not just economic strength, but a combination of all three. And this leads to my final point, and that is wisdom. We have to exercise our power wisely. If we are to deter China from challenging vital American interests, we must also maintain sound alliances and partnerships with our friends, especially in Asia. This requires that we manage our other key bilateral relationships, especially with Japan, in a more consultative manner. And if we wish to integrate China into an international community in which the US plays a leading role, then the rules of that community must be seen to embody a broad international consensus as opposed to simply reflecting the interests of the United States and a few other developed countries. Creating these kinds of legitimate international regimes will also demand less unilateralism and more consultation. So basically, my recommendation for the new administration is that it take this approach to China, that it go beyond the ultimately fruitless debates between isolation and engagement, between uh, partnership and competition between containment and cooperation, and to realize that we need a very multifaceted uh, policy towards China. Basically, it is a policy of wishing China well, uh, honoring China's right to a major seat at the table, integrating it into international regimes with a respected place, but expecting that China live up to those uh, obligations that it thereby undertakes to take a cooperative posture to China, but back up that cooperative posture with strength, but strength that is exercised with, some time, with greater wisdom than we have sometimes shown. 
This will not be a perfect recipe for success. Much will depend on what Chinese uh, leaders uh, decide to do. Certainly, it does not provide any detailed guidance to how to deal with the very specific issues, which I know you're going to raise in just a moment, about WTO and Taiwan and proliferation and human rights. But I think that this combination, this philosophy of approach, has the best chance of success of trying to deal appropriately with an enormously important country and maximizing the chances that our future relationship with China will be cooperative rather than conflictual. Thank you. A short overview has been given. Uh, I, I can't call it definitive, but it certainly pushes in that direction. It was a marvelous summary and uh, a terrific introduction. First question in the rear. Is there a contradiction in uh, advocating a small population and uh, claiming Tibet and, and Taiwan? Well, I don't think they would see it as a, uh, as a contradiction. Uh, I think that they don't see that they are adding Taiwan to their present territory. They simply are adding Taiwan and its territory to a larger China. But I think you raise a very interesting, one of these enormous complexities in, um, uh, in uh, China and in American perceptions of China. I remember, I'm trying to remember who it was. I can't remember the name of the Washington Post correspondent who basically brought uh, the forced abortion issue to the attention of um, a wider audience in the United States back in the 1980s because he ran a series of articles about China's uh, family planning uh, pro programs and all of the coercion that it implied. Uh, this raised the question of forced abortion in the United States and introduced that whole element. It was really the forerunner of the human rights issue in our, in our relations with China. The correspondent, which I could remember his name, but he came back and he was quite. No, no, no. He was he was uh, a Stanford PhD student. This he was not a correspondent for the Post. It's, Mosier was also very important, but the correspondent for the Post came back and said, "I didn't intend for it to have this consequence. What I wanted to show was how complex the issues in China are, and how what what horrible dilemmas the leadership faces. On the one hand, they have these horrible demographic problems that you've mentioned." And yet, if they try to deal with them which the, with the only mechanism that will work in the short run, that is a series of incentives, sometimes very draconian, to limit births, they will be condemned in the United States for addressing this very serious problem. You yourself suggested the answer when you said, in Europe and in the United States and every other developed country, you don't need forced abortion. The answer is development. That's the answer. Uh, and in fact, as parts of China develop, especially the urban areas, you see exactly the consequences you're alluding to. That is, birth rates go down. Uh, you don't need children to help tend the soil. You don't need them to provide social security. Developed societies do not need large families in the way you have a higher uh, survival rate, so you are not you know, having many so that a few will survive. And that's the answer. The answer to China's uh, population problem in the long term is development, because that will reduce the need, perceived needs of families to have, uh, uh, to have children. In fact, the Chinese government is now responding to this dilemma and the outrage that their previous policies have produced both inside and outside China by going the other way. Uh, they are now loosening up on the one child per family policy in rural areas. That is going to make their uh, population problem perhaps worse uh, in the, at least in the middle term. But they've concluded that this is a policy that, in a sense, they can't enforce any longer and pay a huge political price. But the solution is really development. How does the uh, argument that uh, uh, most uh, normal trade relations hurts human rights play out with the argument that it, in fact, will help in the long run? Um, let me ask you to take the last part of the question first, which you, which you didn't summarize about the monitoring. That is indeed a part of the legislation. I assume it will survive uh, the Senate and uh, will become law. Uh, we already monitor human rights in China uh, through NGOs, Amnesty International, Asia Watch, through the State Department, uh, 
the uh, uh, Bureau of Humanitarian Affairs and the annual Human Rights Report. This will simply be another monitor. Um, it's not going to make a bit of difference. But if it means that congressmen uh, feel a little bit better about voting uh, for PNTR, uh, then I think it's a, it, it, it can't do much harm as long as the monitoring is done in a, uh, in a reasonable and balanced way. Uh, the other two parts of your question are, uh, I think, more complicated. Um, did the vote reward China? This, this to me is fascinating because I see WTO as being precisely the same as the non-proliferation treaty, uh, as the various, uh, as the Montreal environmental uh, protocols, as every other regime that we want China to sign on to. When China signs the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, we don't say we, we rewarded China by allowing it to sign. We say, finally, it agreed to abide by international rules. The same thing is true with WTO. We fought very hard for China to agree to all of these rules. The only thing that we have agreed to in return of any great significance is that we simply make permanent what China already had, which is, uh, which is PNTR. So I find it very odd that people, you're not the only one, you summarized it very well. This is a reward. It's not a reward. It is simply a deal that brings China into another international uh, regime. And I think that uh, it should be seen in that light. Uh, now, the, the fundamental question is, will this promote human rights in China? Um, there are no guarantees. But I would say, if I had to bet, what are the odds? Is it more likely? that China will continue to evolve uh, politically the way we'd like if we give it PNTR and it enters WTO, or if not, and we try to block its membership. Uh, I will tell you the odds are far greater if we, if we do it. Uh, this will continue to open China to uh, all kinds of foreign ideas and influences. It will restructure the Chinese economy away from state control. Uh, it will, uh, therefore, I think, be a significant leavening factor in China, although there are no guarantees. Conversely, if we were to have said no, the Chinese would have taken this as a sign that the United States had fundamentally hostile intent towards them. That after having negotiated this, having gotten almost everything we wanted, we say, we're still not going to do it because we don't like you. We're not going to take yes for an answer because we don't like you. The Chinese government at that point is going to come to the conclusion that the United States wishes it ill. That is why I put reassurance at the top of my list. A government in China that believes it is beleaguered from the outside as well as beleaguered at home is not going to open up politically. They just are not going to do it. Uh, so it seems to me that that would have doomed political reform for a very, very long period of time. It is only a government in China that is more confident and relaxed about its environment externally that will dare to open up internally, because the Chinese leaders historically have always seen a very close connection between external enemies and internal dissenters. The last time you are going to, the, last, the least likely occasion to open up to internal dissent is when you feel beleaguered uh, from the outside. So again, no guarantees, but I'll wager that if we had voted against, that would not have promoted human rights, just the contrary. Uh, there's much more to discuss, and I know you're interested in his answers, uh, but we're going to have to end it. And let me, on behalf of the audience, thank you for sharing your good wisdom with us. Thanks so much. <laughs>